Well, like John, it's uh, great to be back with you after the uh, dose of the dreaded, um, fit and well. So thank you so much for your prayers for Penny and I. Uh, we're so grateful for each and every one of them. I also want to say a big thank you to, uh, to Frank for uh, all the songs and uh, readings that he's, he's uh, chosen this morning because each and every one of them is so relevant to the message for today. So uh, bless you. Um, it's wonderful when uh, the Spirit leads us in these things. And uh, thank you, Frank. Well, we continue our journey with, uh, with the Israelites uh, and their exodus from captivity. Uh, two weeks ago, 
we witnessed God's almighty power in three decisive actions. First of all was the Passover itself. Uh, when God saved his people, the Israelites, from the tenth plague, the plague uh, that he sent, uh, killing all the firstborn uh, sons in Egypt, both um, <clears throat> uh, human and, and the animals as well. The blood of the lambs painted on the doorposts and lintels uh, was a sign uh, to the angel of death to pass over the Israelites' homes. The second uh, amazing thing was the safe passage God provided for the Israelites to cross through the Red Sea, cross it in, on dry land. And thirdly, the destruction of the entire Egyptian army when they tried to pursue the Israelites too through that same passage of dry land in the Red Sea. Exodus 14, 30 uh, sums it up beautifully. Thus the Lord delivered Israel that day from the Egyptians. Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the shore of the sea. And when Israel saw the wondrous power which the Lord had wielded against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord. They had faith in the Lord and his servant Moses. Having passed safely through the Red Sea and made it to the other side, uh, chapter 15 of Exodus opens with a wonderful worship song of praise. And uh, it's where um, Mir uh, Moses and Miriam, Moses' sister, burst into song. And, uh, and this is what they sing. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defender. He has become my salvation. That's the first song recorded in scripture, the first of many. So Israel sang just as we've been singing this morning and uh, as we've uh, worshipped our Lord. But Israel's sh song was short-lived. As we know, the party soon wore off. Escaping from Pharaoh's control in Egypt was just the first half of the Exodus. For the Israelites, freedom from oppression and uh, losing the chains of slavery was absolutely vital. But that was the first step. There was much more that was uh, to come. There was freedom for a new purpose. We remember that uh, God gave Moses a message to give to Pharaoh. And the message was to let my people go so that they may worship me. So the first one is to, to the instruction to let his people go for the purpose of worshipping the Lord. We are hardwired, aren't we, to worship? And uh, in Hebrew, the same word is used for worship and served. The question is who or what will we worship? I was never a, a Bob Dylan fan. Um, many of you will remember him, but I, I wasn't particularly keen on his stuff. But he, did, he got it right when he sang these words. You've got to serve somebody. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. For the Israelites, freedom was about being released from slavery to, being, to be able to serve the Lord. And uh, they, they, instead of the persecutor, they would worship the rescuer. <clears throat> we are saved by grace through faith, praise God. We're set free from the tyrant Satan who is set free to worship our Lord and Saviour. Before the Exodus event really got going, God had already told Moses of the promise of the plans he had for his people. I've promised to bring you out of your misery in Egypt into a land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 3, 7. In the ancient world, milk and honey were symbols of uh, uh, richness and rest. Now, given how straightforward it sounds. The Israelites probably thought that uh, after a successful jailbreak, as it were, it would be a walk in the park to enter the promised land. But sometimes real change doesn't happen quite like that. 
And I think the Exodus is a, uh, an honest guide into freedom. Um, many of you will remember uh, Nelson Mandela's biography it was entitled A Long Walk to Freedom. And uh, it was a long walk, not just for Mandela, but for the Israelites too. And sometimes it can be for us as well. So they've crossed the Red Sea. <clears throat> They're wandering through the wilderness. Let's move on three months. <clears throat> they face many challenges and difficulties in those three months. And they finally, finally come to the foot of a mountain. Not just any old mountain, but Mount Sinai, or otherwise known as Mount Horeb. Moses had been here before. It's the same place where he encountered God through the burning bush. But now he's not on his own. He's got the whole nation of Israel with him. And God, come down, God comes down the mountain to reveal himself to them in an experience they will never ever forget. I want to pause there just for a second and um, ask you this. How do you imagine God to be? Take your time for a moment and uh, because it's perhaps the most revealing thing about us. You know some people think of God as a, some miserable Victorian who's uh, austere and repressive full of thou shalt nots and just ready to zap us the moment we step out of line. Others uh, have a, a different view. They think he's um, a, a liberal-minded God who will accept anything and anybody and uh, you know, he's a kind of sugar daddy, uh, my mate upstairs. But when we come to Exodus 19, it shatters both of those illusions, those extremes. God declares himself so loving that Israel can trust him and so holy that they should fear him. Not with a fear of being afraid, but with a reverence, an awe, a wonder at his majesty. In a, a, a series of, of pyrotechnic eruptions, that make the firework displays on New Year's Eve all around the world seem like a damp squib. God revealed his fearsome holiness. And we read that in Exodus 19, verses 16 through to 19. We'll come back to that in a moment. But first, through two surprising metaphors, God reassured Israel that they could trust him. Firstly, he says, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests. How beautiful is that? I know it's not scriptural, but um, I love the poem, Footprints in the Sand. And uh, it speaks of a man having uh, a, a dream about walking across a beach with the Lord. And uh, as each scene flashed through his mind, he noticed that there were two sets of footprints when he looked behind him. But uh, then he realised that in the difficult times, in the trying times, in the lonely and testing times, when he looked back, he only saw one set of footprints. So he questioned the Lord, saying, you, didn't you promise never to leave me or forsake me? Yet when I was at the lowest point in my life, when I look back, I only see one set of footprints. You left me when I needed you most. And the Lord replied, he said this, my precious child, when you saw only one set of footprints, that was when I was carrying you. As uh, the Lord had carried the people, as it says, I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself so we can trust the Lord to carry us in our difficult times. God is not only our rock, he's our defender as well. The second metaphor is even more personal. He says, you will be my treasured possession. 
The Hebrew word for treasured possession is sigala. As, as a parent searches for her child in a, in a special treasure in a playground looking for their little one, so God declares his covenant love for this rabble of slaves. Israel needed to hear this, being fresh out of slavery and in a very abusive relationship. In um, Exodus 15, we read that just three days after leaving, uh, having crossed over from the Red Sea, at the first sign of hardship, they wanted to go back to Egypt. There was no resilience, and emotionally, they were all over the place. Out in the wilderness, with Israel feeling exposed and vulnerable, God declares his loving intentions towards them. He doesn't use threats or compulsions. He doesn't even use the, uh, the payback model. I've helped you over the Red Sea, now you owe me big time. No, he just commits to loving them just as they are, warts and all. And he elevates them into a relationship of dignity and honour. And that covenant relationship that he established with Israel he will never, ever break. That choosing to set them free, God intended to release Israel uh, <clears throat> uh, from the power uh, to be a, a power for other people. In a broken world, Israel would soon recover what it meant to be human again. They would enjoy such freedom that they would set others free in the process. This was God's invitation to Israel. And through Jesus, that invitation is the same for us today. As we shared communion just now, uh, you know, we read those words, the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Jesus bled and died to get us out of Satan's grip, to restore us to uh, a life of the original dignity and purpose that he had planned for us in the beginning. In receiving and believing in him, uh, we experience true exodus from freedom uh, for freedom. Now, I'm so grateful this morning that John gave me this uh, section in uh, the Exodus story to speak on, because now comes the, uh, the, the real uh, crux of the matter when they reach the base of Mount Sinai. There, God gives them the law, the Ten Commandments. The Bible celebrates God's law, or Torah, Hebrew for instruction. Uh, in Proverbs 8, 11, it says, as more precious than rubies. And in Psalm 119, verse 103, it says, the law is sweeter than honey. However, uh, in our cultural uh, context, you know, external rules and uh, moral authority are often considered a threat to our freedom. And we know some regimes are oppressive. We've witnessed that ourselves in the last month, haven't we? With Russia's brutal and evil invasion of Ukraine. But God has our best intentions at heart. His laws were designed to help ex-slaves flourish again, as God's, uh, God intended them to do. Most, uh, one of the most... Um, misunderstood relationships in, in all Christianity is the relationship between God's law and God's grace. At first glance, it seems easy to see uh, where there may be tension, why there may be tension between the two. After all, if, if God's law instructs us not to do something, and we do it anyway, can we really expect him to overlook uh, our indiscretions because of grace. If he's going to give us what we don't deserve every time, that's grace, what is the point of giving the law? So what was the purpose of giving the law, the Ten Commandments, to Israel? Well, we've got to remember, we've got to go back to the beginnings of their captivity for just, from just 70 people of Jacob's family, Israel grew to be a nation within a nation, numbering probably around two and a half million. Uh, some experts say possibly even more. 
And we remember that they had, uh, this is a, a nation of slaves who had never been responsible for themselves. They had no government, they had no king, they had no judicial system, they had no law. They had Moses and uh, the pillar of smoke that led them through the wilderness. And that was it. So God gives them a detailed prescription of how to conduct themselves. While their bloodline was pure, uh, Egyptians would never ever consider marrying slaves. Their culture and perspective of God had become indoctrinated with Egyp Egyptian superstition and religion. And having freed the Israelites from captivity, the Lord is now to going to define the identity of the Hebrew people. They needed to know the God of their forefathers, of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, named Israel. Uh, and uh, God gives them a set of rules to live by. First came the Ten Commandments, and a little later, uh, as we read in Leviticus, uh, the law of Moses would be given more than 600 laws in total, covering every possible situation from uh, sanitation to diet to marriage to property rights. Let's say, have a, book of, uh, have a read of Leviticus. It covers them all. But the one thing that is clear with the law, whether it's the Ten Commandments or the Levitical law, is that it has absolutely nothing to do with salvation, okay? It's nothing to do with where we're going to spend eternity. The law um, doesn't uh, save us. In fact, I love the words of Jesus in Matthew 5.17, where he said uh, at the end, or towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he says he, hasn't, he hadn't come to uh, abolish the law, but to fulfil it. And when you fulfil something, you complete it. It's done. And uh, such words of encouragement from the lips of our Lord himself. So God is simply establishing uh, behavioural guidelines for a group of people who had none. Can you imagine coming out of, of 430 years uh, of uh, captivity, of being a, a, a minority people in another country, in a foreign country, and suddenly you're free. You know, they needed some structure and God gives it to them. The Lord gave birth to this new nation, for that's what it was, and he gives them a new identity. And the first thing he says to them, I am the Lord, your God. I love that. The expression of your God speaks of relationship, doesn't it? Yet the Israelites hadn't done anything to deserve it or to establish a relationship with him. As slaves on the run, they had nothing to offer. They didn't even know how to please him. But just the same, the phrase, your God, affirmed the fact that the Israelites already had a relationship with God. He had claimed them as his chosen people. Because it began some 600 years earlier uh, with the covenant relationship God had made with Abraham. God establishes the relationship first. And as we know, relationships begin and end with trust. And then he goes on to say this, the second commandment, you shall have no other gods besides me. The first commandment is all about trusting God uh, to meet their every need. And on in reflection, he's saying, I want to be the one and only God you have. Why did he need to say this? Well, simply because for the last 400 years or so, the Hebrews have been surrounded by a people had, who had hundreds of gods. They worshipped anything and everything. And uh, this is not what God wanted. He wanted them to worship him and him alone. The, um, the, the first uh, three commandments are all about Israel's God, Yahweh, has pride of place in their lives. No one is to rival him, or no attempt to be made to replicate him. Uh, say, you shall have no other gods besides me is the first one. Do not make a craven image is the second. Do not take the name of the Lord in vain is the third. And then um, the other commandments 
uh, well, they're, they're incredible because they all speak of uh, a relationship with ourselves and looking after one another. That, um, in Exodus 19, God came down uh, from Mount Sinai in a f- in f- with fiery eruptions that split, split rocks and caused the mountain to tremble. The Israelites had front row seats to this, if you like, and you know, it was a, dif- um, a terrifying display. Yahweh is not some third-rate God who be ke- can be kept under control. He is the creator who spoke everything into existence. Earlier, I asked you how you imagined God to be. Well, the Bible carefully blends two truths that must be held in tension. God is so loving that we can trust him. And he is so holy that we should fear him. Have you ever read um, C.S. Lewis's uh, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe? It's a, I, and it's a beautiful story. It really is. I love it. And there's one little bit where I think he captures uh, what that means very uh, beautifully. Um, Mr. Beaver tells Susan that Aslan, the lion, is the ruler of Narnia. Susan is surprised and she asks Mr. Beaver, is he safe? Mr. Beaver laughs, safe? Who said anything about being safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king. And the Ten Commandments remind us that God is not a cute, domesticated deity. He is frightfully holy and lovingly wonderful. Having insisted on the supremacy of God, the remaining commandments emphasise human dignity. And uh, the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day, echoes back to Genesis when God made the world in six days and blessed the seventh as a day of rest. The Hebrew word Shabbat means to rest or cease. And God knew that at the end of each week we would need to rest. The following commandments seek to uh, cultivate honourable relationships. Um, Unlike uh, many of the ancient treaties uh, that focused on property rights, the Ten Commandments value people. To steal, to kill, to lie, to cheat is not merely a moral failure, but it's a violation of the image of God in whose image we are made. The porn industry and human trafficking uh, of humans turn humans into objects or, or mere commodities. And that's not what God plans. God's law rebukes every attempt to use people as things. And instead, we should use things to serve people. The final, uh, uh, the tenth commandment is slightly different. It says, do not covet. Reminds us that God's vision of our freedom cannot be reduced to a simple tick list. God's um, uh, human liberty is about well-ordered desires, free from tyranny of uh, continual uh, comparison. Where does that leave us today with uh, this tension between grace and law? Where are we? Well, the Ten Commandments do not stand in contrast to grace. They are introduced within the story of God's grace. And let me just reiterate that uh, we are not saved by the law. The law can never save us. And I just want to go through some scriptures that uh, speak of this beautifully. Psalm 103 is the first one. And uh, we get the most beautiful picture here, uh, right back um, in the Old Testament. Uh, Where are we? For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. We move on to uh, the New Testament and to uh, Galatians uh, chapter 3, verse 21. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come 
by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner to sin. So that when uh, what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. Hold on to those words. The law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. We're no longer under the supervision of law. Ephesians chapter 2. I love this. Uh, Verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, And this, not from yourselves, it is a gift of God's. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Move on to Colossians chapter 2. And uh, I love this amazing, amazing piece of scripture. Chapter, verse, in, uh, verse 13. <clears throat> when you were dead in your sins and in, your, in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the written code with its regulations that stood against us and, op- and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, having disarmed the powers and authorities he made a public spectacle over them by triumphing on the cross. And perhaps the clearest and and, uh, uh, one we get is out of, uh, is in Hebrews, the clearest message we get about um, the law and grace. And uh, Hebrews um, chapter uh, eight. I'm gonna start read from verse seven onwards. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, covenant of law, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the first covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my first covenant. I turned away from them, declared the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbour or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will know me from the least to the greatest, for I will, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sin no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and ageing will soon disappear. I love those words. They're amazing. God's law, I say, has absolutely nothing to do with our salvation. The law was given to a newly formed nation as a set of rules and principles to help them to understand, to live as God wanted them to live, but not to do with their salvation. The law of God is an expression of his grace. The story of of, of the Exodus and the Ten Commandments reflects something important about God's character. And if we miss this, we'll never understand the role of God's law in our relationship with him. Worse still, if we misunderstand the purpose of God's law, his grace will forever remain a mystery. But uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord, uh, we are no longer subject to that law. Um, we are under grace because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We will, in a two weeks' time, we'll be celebrating Easter and we'll remember that amazing, uh, f- the amazing final words of Jesus on the cross on that Good Friday when he said, it is finished. 
He had fulfilled everything that his father had called him to do. He had fulfilled the law and the prophets. It was done. We were free. We are free from tyranny, uh, from uh, oppression, uh, injustice, and we are able to serve our God through it. Let's pray. Father, we just want to say thank you uh, for the law that you gave to the Israelites because it's formed the basis of many laws of governments around the world ever since. But we're even more grateful for the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ who came to fulfil the law that you'd uh, made with them. We thank you that through his death and resurrection we are free from the law. We We no longer live under its curse but we are free to live under the freedom of grace, freedom to serve you, freedom to uh, be in that new relationship with you, freedom to enjoy that abundant life that you have promised us. So Father, we give you our grateful thanks today and we say thank you for Jesus in his precious name. Amen.